Mass Murders, Columbine, Virginia Tech, Fort Hood, Aurora Movie Theater, the Sikh Temple are horrible examples of mass murder. How does the Second Amendment affect gun ownership in America? What can you do to become an active citizen? How relevant is our Constitution today? Explore this and more with us as we talk with Professor Sanford Levinson from the University of Texas School of Law. Professor Levinson is an acknowledged expert on constitutional law whose opinions and wisdom regarding our Constitution are sought by people across the political spectrum. You may agree or you may disagree, but if you're looking for an informed opinion about our Constitution, you need look no further than Professor Levinson, whose most recent book is titled Framed, America's 51 Constitutions and the Crisis of Governance. You're watching Access News, hands on news. Thank you, Professor Levingson, for being here with us today on Access News. It's my pleasure. We want to talk more about your book, but first, we're going to talk a little bit about the Second Amendment. I know our audience, a lot of them probably watch the news, maybe some of them don't, but I'm sure they've all heard about all of the mass murders that have been happening recently. It seems that they're happening more and more frequently, and I know it's a very complicated topic, but the bottom line is that it involves guns. So let's first start with the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. So let's explain, if you could, expand a little bit on the Second Amendment. Well, as it happens, practically every word or certainly every phrase is controversial. There's a huge debate about the importance of the preamble, that is, a well-regulated militia being necessary to preserve a free state. Does that limit the context within which guns are protected, or do you ignore the preamble, basically just drop it, and view the Second Amendment as if it says only the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed? and you know, people are at each other's throats over how to interpret that. The Supreme Court in 2008, in a very, very bitter five to four decision, basically said that the preamble was irrelevant, of no importance at all, and that the real meaning of the Second Amendment is that there is a right of the people to keep and bear at least firearms. But Heller, which is the 2008 decision, really simply begins a conversation. It doesn't remotely end it because the question is what kinds of firearms and where and who. And the Supreme Court, for example, with regard to who, said that people with criminal records can uh, be deprived of a right to have firearms. People with at least certain mental illnesses could um, and the like. With regard to what kinds of firearms, that particular case dealt with handguns and, uh, and maybe rifles, but for example, it certainly didn't involved machine guns or so-called assault weapons. With regard to where, Heller was about the home. And one of the things that is you know, self-evidently true about the recent mass murders is that they took place outside the home. Interesting, okay. So. Now, if you could, I know you cover a lot of different topics there, but let's go back to the point you made about the militia, um, it, where it mentions the militia in the Second Amendment. I'm not sure that um, 
we all understand the word militia. For some people, I think it um, conjures an image of army, but can you describe militia? Well, that's an excellent question. And that word is also the subject of very, very strong, sometimes bitter debate. I think that most people today, when they think of militia, think of an organized army run by the state. In the 18th century, militia could mean really a self-created community uh, army-like group. And one always has to remember the Minuteman statue in Concord, Massachusetts, and the whole mythology of the American Revolution, which is that, to some extent, it's a citizen's revolution against the professional army of Great Britain. So there has always been, within American thought, a notion that the militia is free citizens coming together to resist an oppressive government. Uh, and that's obviously very different from a militia that's controlled by the government. The first vision is very suspicious of government. The second vision basically says, well, we can trust government. And that's been an argument since the 18th century, and it's very much an argument today. Thank you for clarif clarifying that point. I'd like to talk more about um, guns in the homes, like you mentioned before. What's your opinions? Are, th are there too many guns in America, too few guns in America? Um, you know, it's easy to say that there are too many guns in America. It's also easy to say that there are too many drugs in America. Where I start from is simply the raw fact that there are literally millions upon millions of guns in the United States, just as there is very easy access to drugs if you want drugs. We've been carrying on a war against drugs for at least 40 years. I think most people would say it's quite unsuccessful because there is a huge supply and a huge demand for drugs. I think the same thing is true of guns. And so that any discussion of gun policy as with drug policy has to begin with the basic reality that people want guns. So you're saying that if we decided to ban guns, it wouldn't be successful? No. Because the uh, no. war on drugs wasn't successful? No, that's exactly right. That one can think of drugs, one can also think of alcohol. We passed an amendment to the Constitution, the 18th Amendment, almost 100 years ago, outlawed the possession of alcohol. And we could argue whether that's... And obviously that wasn't successful. No. And you, know, you can have a separate argument. Would it be good if alcohol were not available in the society? I think reasonable people can differ on that. But what I think we concluded as a society is that you cannot stop people who want alcohol from getting it. And so prohibition is viewed as you know, a, quote, noble experiment, but it's an experiment that failed. And the question is, same question is raised with regard to drugs, and the same question would undoubtedly be raised if, for example, we tried to prohibit the ownership of guns. So right now, obviously, guns are not prohibited, but are we doing a good job as far as regulating them here in America? Uh, if, I mean, if not, how can we 
um, improve that um, initiative? That is, you know, an extraordinarily good and difficult question. The awful truth is, and here I come back to the analogy with drugs and with alcohol, is that there are very few people who are informed about the issue of control who are confident that there is any effective way of controlling what we are most afraid of with regard to guns. A lot of gun control legislation is symbolic. That is, it makes people feel that we're doing something, but social scientists who study the stuff generally come up with quite discouraging information as to the actual effectiveness of the so-called controls. And again, you might think of drugs and, and alcohol and the extent to which a variety of programs have or have not been truly successful. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about Supreme Court Justice um, Antonin Scalia and a comment that he made regarding the Second Amendment. I'll paraphrase, but the point was that the Second Amendment referred to guns that could be carried not rocket launchers or, you know, cannons and that sort of thing. And that those issues and the details of those issues would be left to the Supreme Court. What's your comment to that? Well, two things. First of all, as, as a legal matter, the Supreme Court certainly has a significant say in this. There's no doubt about that. What this means is that it may boil down to the more or less intuitive views of somebody like Justice Scalia. When he says, well, the arms that are protected are the kinds of arms that can actually be born by an individual, well, my impression from reading the newspapers is that certain rocket launchers, certain bazookas, um, the kinds of weapons that have killed so many American service men and women in Afghanistan and Iraq can be borne by a single individual on his or her shoulder. So the Scalia distinction is effective with regard to cannons, but quite frankly, in modern warfare, cannons aren't that important. And bazookas and um, mobile rocket launchers um, are. So I just don't know exactly why Justice Scalia thinks that the can you carry it principle will be very helpful in distinguishing what kinds of weapons can be controlled and what kinds can't. Machine guns can obviously be carried by individuals. Yeah, and that actually leads me to the next question. Governor Perry made a comment that um, if we took away guns from law-abiding citizens, that it wouldn't make us any safer. But yet, um, recently, the, the massacre that happened in Colorado at the movie theater, that um, shooter was a law-abiding citizen up until the day of that massacre. So how do you respond to Perry's comment? My response is really to return to what I said earlier, that we could have an argument going on all day and all year about whether if we were designing a society from scratch, we would want to allow guns in it or not. And I think reasonable people can differ on what their answer to that question is. But we don't live in that kind of society. We live in a society 
where there just are hundreds of millions of guns that are owned and available. So it seems to me, frankly, that Governor Perry's comment is beside the point, just as it is beside the point to say, well, if there were no guns at all, we would be better off. That may very well be true, just as I think it probably would be true that we would be better off if we lived in a society that had no liquor. Um, but we don't. <laughs> and to go back to the Prohibition Amendment, we know, in fact, that the cure, the so-called cure, proved to be worse than the disease because people simply weren't willing to obey the law. And people would not obey a prohibitionist law on firearms. It's as simple as that. So what about the idea of leaving that to individual states and letting them to decide? Well, I think that's a very sensible solution. The paradox, I mean, to go back to Justice Scalia for a moment, he often presents himself as somebody who really believes in federalism and in so-called states' rights. But what the Supreme Court did, both in the 2008 decision and then in another decision in 2010, is basically say, we don't care what the state concludes, we know best. And so what the Supreme Court said is that a state could not adopt, whether you think it's a good idea or not, something else. But the Supreme Court has said that a state has no right to adopt a prohibitionist policy. Um, unlike alcohol, where to this day a given state could be dry if it wished to. Um, but that's not the case with guns, thanks to the United States Supreme Court. Okay, well let's talk a little bit about your book, Framed. When I hear the word framed, I, and that's a great title, it makes me think of a lot of, of, a lot of different things. A picture frame, a frame of a house, mm -hmm. boundaries, mm -hmm. <laughs> the framers of our Constitution, uh, and really even, you know, I've been framed that you hear, you know, so many, so many things. But why did you choose the title Framed? What are you trying to convey? Well, that's a wonderful, wonderful comment that you just made because you actually illustrate why I chose this title. And I, I should uh, put in a thank you right now for my wife, because she's the one really who suggested it, because the word framed really does have all the associations you suggest, and they're just the associations that I want readers to have in the back of their mind. Let me just pick up on two of them. One is very much the notion of a picture frame or the notion of boundaries. And one of the things a constitution does is to set up quite rigid um, uh, frames of government. Um, and the we was framed, uh, you know, it, it also, now actually I don't suggest that the framers were like a rogue police department. I don't think they were out to frame us. But it is true that they did frame us in certain ways. And one of my arguments is that whatever one thinks of the decisions they made in 1787 as to whether they were good for the United States of that time, I argue quite strongly that a lot of their decisions are very bad for the United States in 2012. Let me just say, the, the book has a subtitle. Uh, what, give me an example of what you think is a bad decision related to 2012. Well, the, the, the subtitle is America's 51 Constitutions and the Crisis of Governance. And there are two things that are contained in that subtitle. One is that 
there really are 51 constitutions. That is, each state, including Texas, obviously has its own constitution. And they differ in very, very dramatic ways from the United States Constitution. I also argue that one of the reasons that so many people, regardless of political party, it doesn't matter whether you're on the right or the left, a Democrat or a Republican, right now you find that roughly one in seven or one in eight Americans have any respect for Congress. Most Americans think the country is going the wrong direction. Um, a lot of Americans feel alienated from government. And my argument is that the Constitution as framed in 1787 contributes to that. We're involved right now in an election that a lot of people say is the most important election in our lifetimes. It might be. One can imagine outcomes where we would say, well, you know, we're going to tell our children about the election of 2012 because it will really change things. But let me suggest that the more likely outcome is that the 2012 election is going to change nothing because the national government is constructed in such a way that in order to pass significant legislation, you have to go through the House of Representatives, the United States Senate, and the president who can always veto the bill. So it really is a situation, in, it's like astrology. All of the stars have to be aligned in order for an election really to be important. So I think a lot of people feel disengaged from the American political system right now. They voted in 2008, the people who voted for President Obama, voted for change we can believe in. Well, with regard to the issues that are truly important to a lot of people, they haven't seen the change they can believe in. Some of this might be related to disappointment with President Obama, but a lot of it is related to the fact that what the president wants is, I don't want to say irrelevant, but it's far, far less important than we think it is because any president has to have the support of the House and the Senate. And all you have to do is to read the newspapers and realize that the House and the Senate are often obstructionist rather than supportive. And that is because the framers in 1787 believed or hoped that we would have a political system without political parties. They were disastrously wrong. We actually came close to civil war in 1800 over the election of Thomas Jefferson because of the sheer stupidity of the electoral college system that they created in 1787. We did go to war in 1860 and killed 750,000 Americans because of compromises that were made in 1787 about slavery and the inability of Congress effectively to respond to the crisis of slavery. The Great Depression, between, especially between 1929 and 1932, was much worse than it might have been because of divided government between a Republican president and a Democratic Congress. And these are features of the Constitution that I think we don't spend enough time talking about. They sound like dull and boring civics course issues. But my view is that if you want to understand why so many people feel disengaged, why I think 
it is legitimate to talk about a crisis of governance. I think it is because of a series of institutions that were created about 225 years ago under assumptions that frankly don't make so much sense today. Well, you really covered a lot about your book and I appreciate you sharing um, the crisis of our governance. I want to thank you for uh, being with us on the show today. You can learn more about the work of Professor Levinson at our website, accessnews.us, where you can ask questions and share your comments and opinions. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. One beautiful thing about America is that we, the people, have power. The more we know, the better decisions we can make. For Access News, I'm Tamara, and that's Austin. Thank you, Professor Levin. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Created, written, and executive produced by Devorah Ben Moshe and Ken Hurley. Hosted by Tamara Suter Okudo. Interpreter for Tamara Suter Okudo, Jennifer Stoker. Special thanks to Texas School for the Deaf. Funding provided by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Supported by Austin Community Foundation. Production by Austin Community College. Civication Incorporated, www.civication.org.